Good evening. Good to be with you. Thankful to be with you. Glad that you're here. Uh, I don't know, it seems at least off the just quick look, a, a good number uh, returning tonight and appreciate that, the opportunity to worship together. And I just wanted to say a few things. Uh, we had the opportunity, let's, it's on my mind, fresh on my mind and uh, sitting behind the young people, but thinking about last night uh, at our sweetheart banquet and the opportunity we had, uh, appreciate so many being there, uh, affording us the opportunity to spend some time with you, but uh, the work that went in uh, to, to make that possible, the young people, uh, we had many more than we had uh, last year and just spent time together and, and they appreciate that time they got to spend together serving and washing dishes and spilling coffee and uh, doing all those things together. It was a, uh, a, a great time, a blessed time. And speaking of that, uh, you know, we found out uh, last night uh, what we already knew, uh, what so many already knew, right? And the, the females beat the males in, in a game in the battle of the sexes. But uh, speaking of uh, the great women we do have here and the ladies that we do have coming up in the spring quarter, uh, in the spring quarter, we're going to have an opportunity, our young ladies, and thinking about an intergenerational push and, and how important that is to develop relationships, uh, right, all generations, that we're uh, young people and older alike, we're all a part of the same body. And so having the opportunity this spring quarter, uh, our young ladies, to, to spend with the ladies uh, in a class that uh, Ms. Donna Drain will lead. And then we, uh, the young men will have an opportunity in a men's class. And some more details about that class will be coming out. But uh, it'll be a great opportunity. I hope you'll pray for that and encourage that. I know that can maybe be something uh, young people kind of push off in older life. We maybe want to get away at, at certain times. But this will be a blessed time for us to open up the Word of God together. And I think there can be some great benefits, as I'm sure some of you can, can think about uh, as well. But that, that That'll be a great opportunity. I hope that you'll pray about and be thinking about. One more thing I want to say, and parents especially focused at you, um, we, this, this week, and I, I've mentioned it a few times now, but this is uh, Kindness Week uh, that the world sort of looks at. A, or a lot of people, they've actually made this week Random Act of Kindness Week. And so we wanted to, to jump on that and think about our role and responsibility as Christians to, to be kind people. It's a fruit of the Spirit. It, it ought to be evidenced in our life that we're kind. And, and we sort of are playing a game this week. And I hope you'll support your children and think about the things uh, we'll celebrate with a, a bowling uh, next Sunday in pizza party. And we'll ce celebrate our kindness together and think about and reflect on the ways that we did that uh, this week. And I just think it'll be a great opportunity uh, for the young people to be practicing those things. Ask them about their kindness bingo uh, sheets and be thinking and praying about this week. And, and I wonder what the kindness uh, that it will be coming from. Uh, ultimately, a responsibility we have to do that, an obligation to God himself because of the great joy and hope that was found in Christ, his kindness that we reflect that in a way that will bring him glory and it also draw us closer to one another. Tonight, we're going to look at something and I'm indebted and I put it in there, but I wanted to just make sure that I get this out there. But uh, Brother Dwayne Bryan, he's an uh, instructor and he's been here. Dr. Bryan has uh, preached from this pulpit, but he's written a book, Who's Like the Lord? Who is like the Lord? And of course, the, the, the response is, is, is nobody, absolutely nobody. And that's where I've sort of been drawing um, the uh, subject matter for the sermons I've been preaching, the character of God. We've been talking about faith, and it's great uh, to boost our faith and understand what it, it means to have faith and how do we develop that. And, and, but we need to know who our faith is in. And this has been a really challenging study for me, and I don't know if I've uh, been able to convey the depth of these lessons very well, but I hope tonight we'll think about the power of God the omnipotence of God, the all-powerful, almighty God. And I want to read something to you. And if you have the bulletin, it's in, in there. Uh, the quote is in there as we think about uh, this. Christianity at any given time is strong or weak depending upon her concept of God. And I insist upon this, and I've said it many times, that the basic trouble with, with, with which the church today is her unworthy conception of God. Our religion is weak. Because our God is weak. Our religion is weak because our God is weak. And of course, it would have to be the case that this God he's speaking of would be one we've created. Because when you open up your Bibles and we read through Scripture and we see the way he's worked, he, he's done it powerfully. It's an unbelievable, all-merciful, all-loving, just God, creator of the world. And so that would all, undoubtedly be a God that we've created in our own minds, but yet... 
it's true, I wonder if the God that we serve is the Almighty, right, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Or perhaps we've sort of replaced him, right, this, this weaker God of fear, of doubt, of pain. The, the one the 21st century uh, might want to exalt and say, well, nobody really exalts that God, but, but the God of the world, right, who, who's created you and has, his obligation is to you. He's your personal valet and he's here to, uh, to, to serve you. And if I respond to him, he'll give me everything I want and everything I need. That, that's a very weak God. And I think that's the God he was speaking of. And we might think that's the God that we would want to serve, but, it, but it's far from the God we would want to serve. And it might seem hard, and it might seem harsh to understand the all-powerful God and the way we've been taught, the wrathful God. But I hope tonight that we can get a picture of this God from Scripture and understand He's absolutely the one we would want uh, our lives to revolve around. That He is the center of the universe, yes, but, but may He be the center of our universe as well. And so as we open up and we begin to see, if you're following along in the outline, the idea of comparing and contrasting looking at the limitations of man versus the omnipotent God, this all-powerful God. And, and of course, as we think about this, to, to compare would be a very, it would be like the blank that's on your page. <laughs> Who is like the Lord? There's no comparing when we think about man and we think about God, but we could do some contrasting and we could think about uh, the separation there is between us and God. And as we think about that, to think outside the box, in this box of divine revelation, though, if we'd be consumed with the biblical picture of God and all his glorious power, that we would understand and realize the great contrast there is with God. You see, we think very conditionally. And everything in our lives is conditional. If we fail, that's a, that's a natural part of our lives because of our limited resources, you know, physically, mentally, spiritually. And, and no matter how great our plans are, and no matter what kind of strategy we apply, we will fail. We're limited and our judgments are made based upon our self-perceived limitations and this is just a natural part of our thinking. But to think in terms of zero limitations, to think in terms that, that there's absolutely no limitations is really beyond all of our full comprehension, but that is exactly what studying the omnipresence of God demands us to do. To think of no limit. You know, I want to create something. I want to do something. There's no limit to what I'm able to do and, and what I'm able to accomplish. And that's exactly what it means, right? All power. Omnipotent. All power. There's nothing he cannot do. My God is so big. He, he's so strong and so mighty. And it, we reverberate that at VBS. And somewhere along the lines, perhaps we forget it. That's the same God. We, it doesn't change as you grow up, right? It's just that we begin to form a, bit, a different picture. When you open your Bibles to Romans chapter 8, I hope you'll turn there. In Romans 8, this outline that's on the page isn't the outline of Romans 8. It's really a topical study, and, and I know uh, that it is in no way an exposition of the text fully, but there's some topical things that jump off the page that, that I hope when we grasp a little bit of the power of God, we'll, we can also end with the words of Paul. We can exalt with the, if God is for us, who can be against us? And there's some things that jump off the page in my mind as we think about the power of God when we open up our Bibles to Romans chapter 8. The power of God. And might not be where you're necessarily thinking, but notice how it opens. There is therefore now, this is Romans 8 verse 1, no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who, who don't walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. The law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. On account of his sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh, they set their minds on things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. 
And I don't know if perhaps I know when we're going to look in a moment at the great grandeur and the power of God and probably what you might be thinking when you think of an omnipotent God. But to get a comprehension, or it, it, that God, the, the Almighty, the strong God, does this, what we read in Romans 8. He changes our very nature. And I imagine in an audience tonight in this size, we look and we, we walk through life and, and we struggle with doing that translating ourselves into the kingdom, right? Thinking about, oh, I, I don't have to worry about those concerns. I don't, I'm not consumed. I'm not uh, being drugged down by those things. It speaks of the fleshly life. I've been translated. I'm now in the spirit. I've been translated, right? And the, just the language that's here, I think we long for that life and peace. I don't want to be carnally minded. And yet maybe over and over, like when you back up a little in Romans 7, you see Paul himself, the apostle, challenged with the very thought of, of doing the things he doesn't want to do and being the person he doesn't want to be. Who can change that? How can I get rid of that guilt? It was prayed this morning, Josh's prayer. A beautiful, help us to do that. How do I accept that? By understanding the almighty, all-powerful God. He's the one who can do that. He can translate. He can change the very nature of your soul. And so here's some powerful things I hope we'll begin to see. But when we look at this all-powerful God and we think about and we're comparing what he's able to do and what he's able uh, to accomplish, we see that there's this idea of the levels of his power. And I was appreciative that Brother Bryant brought this out because I, I wouldn't have thought this way. And, and there's so many ideas that we could think of in terms of how big God is and what he's able to do. And he, he broke it out in three ways. And I hope this is help for, for, helpful for you to meditate upon the power of God and so that we can, we can understand how great he is and then translate that in a personal way. But here we see the levels of his power. Number one, it's cosmic and perhaps the most dramatic and maybe some of the ways you think of when you think of the power of God is where you thought we might be going and, and we're going to stay here for a moment and it draws us to creation and the incredible wonders that you know are really beyond our full comprehension you know sometimes it's hard to imagine something uh the power of something uh if any of you have ever shot a gun you ever shot a gun um had the opportunity to go out and do that. I don't remember the first time I did it. Um, I think it was a BB gun probably. But uh, I, I do remember different times that I've shot a gun that I'd never shot before. Have you ever been there? And I remember one time, uh, you know, we're, we're walking uh, through uh, sort of the ravines of the hill country with my brothers-in-law, uh, both of them with me, and we were eradicating the hog population. That's become a little bit of a nuisance, and we were enjoying ourselves. But I never shot, I don't remember what the caliber was, but I never shot this particular gun. And we, we come up over this hill, and we see uh, lots of pigs out there. And so my opportunity, I'm excited about uh, shooting this gun, and scopes up and you know crosshairs on this pig and boom drop that pig and just in my excitement you know turning to high five and I'm met with like faces like what's going on and and above my right eye there's this huge gash <laughs> and, and in the excitement I guess I did not feel that but I'd underestimated the power of, of that weapon apparently and uh it's just gashed my whole uh, I open bleeding everywhere, but you know, underestimating that power. Have you ever been in, it's hard to maybe grasp the power of something. We think about something as small as a gun and, and you start expanding that to think about what about nuclear power? It's hard for, for any of us probably in this room to imagine that. There's some people in the world who, who could think back and, and, and imagine the power of a nuclear eruption. But what about if you think about a nuclear reactor, as Dwayne Bryant says, thousands of Earths in size, <laughs> the sun. And, and you think about the power that that puts off, but, but more than that, in the 200 billion stars that are in the galaxy, and what was behind that creation of those things. And, and if you've ever tried to do something or create something or, or you know, go out there. It, what does it take? It takes exertion. It takes power. It takes movement. And when you read about what 
supplies all that power, though? If you look in your Bibles in Hebrews chapter 1, Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3, what we hear and what we learn is that those things and all the universe is sustained by the word of his power. By the very word. He speaks and these things happen. He doesn't have to work out to go make it happen. It's just a part of his being. He's totally and comprehensively, he's all-powerful. There's this cosmic power. is a level of his power that just sort of, I think, challenges uh, our thinking. And yet we come along and we move a little bit. And, and maybe a power that we can just maybe grasp a little bit, little bit better is his corporate power. But can I remind you of a passage that jumped off the page when I thought about his cosmic power in Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 40? To whom, to whom then will you liken me that I would be his equal, says the Holy One, God speaking. Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these stars. The one who leads forth their host by number, he calls them all by name. Because of the greatness of his might and the strength of his power, not one of them's missing. Why do you say, O Jacob? And assert, O Israel, that my way is hidden from the Lord, and the justice due me escapes the notice of my God. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the world, he does not become weary or tired. His understanding is inscrutable. He gives strength to the weary and to him who lacks might. He increases their power. Though youths grow weary and tired and vigorous young men stumble badly at those who wait for the Lord. They'll gain new strength. They'll mount up with wings like eagles. They'll run and not get tired. They'll walk and not become weary. <laughs> the almighty, powerful God of the world exerts himself. He shows himself in that passage, but then he speaks to what that power accomplishes. He doesn't just hold it in. He's not some separated deity, some uh, deistic, right? Uh, this, this idea that, that I've separated myself i don't care about humanity but but it's more than that he is the very supply of that power when you think about uh this idea we'll come back to that in a moment hold on to the idea though that to get big results god has to be in the effort to get big results god has to be in the effort and you notice in the isaiah passage that's what he's saying <laughs> i'm going to be the supplier and I wonder if your faith is weak or your Christianity is weak, your religion is weak because you're doing a little bit too much of the supplying. Here's sort of the implications. What about on a corporate level, running through this and thinking about uh, his people collectively? In 1 Samuel chapter 4 and verse 8, the, the Bible reads, Woe to us, who shall deliver us out of the hand of these mighty gods? These are the gods that smote the Egyptians with all the plagues in the wilderness. Here are the Philistines, and they're responding many, many years later about what happened when God came out, right? He, not the God that separated, that you could look in like Romans 1 and verse 20 and, and know without an excuse that he exists and he's there. He left that region, right? He, he's the God that dwelt with the people of Israel. And he came down and he redeemed them from Egypt. And you remember and you recall that here he is showing his power. He's showing the gods of Egypt impotent and otherwise non-existent. That they're idols that they've created. And, and every single, all ten of the plagues, he shows himself more powerful in ultimately revealing that he is the God of heaven and earth. He is the only one and true living God. But here are the Philistines, obviously not having a full comprehension of those things. They see these Israelite people, these Hebrew people coming, and they say, what are we to do with a God so big? They knew and they recognized his power that he worked on behalf of the people. And so not only is there this cosmic power, God not only in the Old Testament and the New Testament has corporately worked for his people, but it goes even beyond that, doesn't it? Not only is there cosmic, corporate, but there's this personal power God has shown. And it's amazing, and it really separates himself from all the other ideas in which gods uh, have been created in the minds of men and women throughout history. 
and you could see it perhaps. And if we had time, I would love to go there. I know uh, maybe tonight, getting weary already, it's getting late, and I'm trying to move through this that we can all together think about this in a positive way, that, that we can hold on to some of these things, that, that the God who's all-powerful, and we're beginning to see how he works, that he, he's powerful in our lives, but this personal idea needs to be talked about and thought about, and, and you can find it in John chapter 11. You can find it in many places, but when you, you open up your New Testament, you see that there, there's very personal way in which God God begins to work in the lives of people. He worked through the apostles, and he ultimately shows up in Christ's life himself, right? Uh, the Word himself, uh, God in the, f- in the flesh, and the Word became flesh, and he dwelt among us. And we think about the power of that and what he was able to do. But in John 11, we see this scenario, and Mary and, and Martha come running to him, and even the others are, are squawking in the background. Right? This guy made uh, the blind to see right? The dumb to speak. Why? Surely he could have saved Lazarus. He could have healed Lazarus. And Jewish tradition says that, you know, they thought the the spirit of the man would hover over the body for three days. And maybe you recall this was the fourth day when Jesus gets to Lazarus. This is the fourth day when Jesus gets to Lazarus, so much so that his body stunk. He was dead. And of course, we have the passage which shows us something incredible about the God of heaven and earth and all his power. He's personal, and he's weeping over his friend, Lazarus. And in that moment, right, and we we can recall and we could see the personal way God works and he moves and he says, Lazarus, rise. And he did just that. God spoke and he shows the power that he has over the this painful reality that we all all fear that humanity fears as a whole and he says you don't have to fear that and why do so many do why do you maybe it's because we don't comprehend an all-powerful God and we've left him in VBS he's the God that's with us He's here with us. And so as we continue to think maybe in terms of this powerful God and what he's able to do, one of the things that highlights his personal nature is his restraint. Is his restraint. It's an unbelievably puzzling story, especially from the world's perspective. It highlights maybe what we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, the foolishness, right, uh, of the gospel to those that are in the world. But the wisdom of God for those who are being saved. And we think about the foolishness of a story of parents in a stable, perhaps even a a cave, a cut-out cave or some sort uh, in Bethlehem. And the baby, Mary, did you know the song that some sing when they held up that baby and they looked into his eyes? It was the very face of God. The very face of God. It's puzzling and it's dramatic and it's a powerful story, but he came to his own and his own did not receive him. He was abandoned, he was despised, he was murdered, and and as he was being betrayed in the garden, Peter pulls his sword and Jesus puzzled that he couldn't see and understand the power of God. When I face obstacle after obstacle, when I'm burdened and I'm exhausted in this life, when I fail to see the reality of the spiritual, the power that God had that we're talking about, that he's translated this carnal mind into something spiritual. I, I think maybe more of us can see ourselves in Peter's shoes. When, when Jesus himself, who's walked with him, is dumbfounded, and do you not think that I couldn't appeal to my father? Remember Matthew chapter 26. He pulls the sword. Don't you think I could appeal to my father? And I could at this very moment at once send more than 12 legions of angels. Matthew 26 and verse 53. 12 legions of angels, a legion that its full power in the Roman army would be 6,000 soldiers. Some 72,000 angels Jesus could have called right at that very moment. And, And it only took one, do you remember? In 1 Kings, it took one angel to destroy 185,000 Assyrians one angel what could 72,000 have done made the earth but just a small void in the universe and yet we see his restraint 
see the power of God for us that that his creation might be called back from this unbelievable show, right, of love. There's power, because when we think about the world and we think about power and we think maybe even politics, well, it takes deception, it takes cruelty, it takes control. I've got to hand my, uh, have my hand over things and trick and turn. And, and how does God create an all-powerful kingdom out of humility and restraint? Maybe it touches on that idea of meekness we read about. They shall inherit the earth. Power restrained. And the power of God in that moment, it also brought me to the passage in 1 Corinthians 12 when Paul says, Three times I pleaded with my Lord about this, that it should leave me, but he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the, for the sake of Christ, then, I'm content with weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. I couldn't help but think about Romans 8 and verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weakness, for we don't know what we should pray for, what we, uh, for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And I don't know, and I suffer in this life, but have this God who created the world and the power that we've talked about him having. And yet he also says, as you jump up back a little bit in Romans chapter 8, Therefore, brethren, we're debtors not to flesh, to live according to flesh. For if you live according to flesh, you'll die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you'll live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God and of children heirs and heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him that we may also be glorified together. The restraint that comes into our lives. And I don't know why it is over and over Scripture tells us things like that, yet it's in those moments when we question him the most. And yet his power in that moment when he says, look what I could have done. Those are the moments he's transforming us and he's making us something greater. He's working in your life. And that's why I said, I hope you would remember. I hope you'd remember the idea that, listen, it's God who must be present in your life and working. When we think about the source of the works and the faith that we're speaking of, it, we can't have the American mentality, right? That I'll pull myself, you know, pull uh, the boots on and, and I'll get to work and I'll be able to do it and I can conquer these things in my life. And if that's our attitude and what we're going to accomplish, we're going we're to fall flat. The power is in Christ himself. It's God himself working in us. And it's this great paradox of Christianity, one of many, that, that I've got to let go more often, that I can experience that power. You remember as Paul is uh, preaching and talking to the Corinthians, right? I planted, uh, Paul is watered. How did anything get done, though? Where was the power? God did that. And so it's not more about me and what I can accomplish. It's It's this final point, and it'll be brief because it's, I think, pretty self-explanatory. Trusting. So many of us, right, we acknowledge the power of God. There would be none of us. We, we sing it all the time, how great thou art, right? And we sing wonderful, our God, he is alive. No doubt we believe in the greatness and grandeur of God. We acknowledge his greatness, but who has accepted it? Who trusts in the very promises of God? Because God has to be in the middle of those things. If we accept that, notice as Paul ends this chapter, and while I said it's 
pretty self-explanatory. Uh, when you look at verse 31, Romans 8, familiar text, but I, I don't believe anybody will be discouraged to hear it again. What shall we say to these things if, if God, what picture does that evoke in your mind? I hope when you read Romans 8 or you read anywhere else, it's the, the all-powerful, omnipotent God. There's nothing he can't do. There's no limitations in him. That's the very definition of omnipotent, right? That's God. What shall we say? If God's for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but he delivered him up for us all. Um, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against us? God's elect. It's God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It's Christ who died. Furthermore, it's all, uh, he's, he's also risen. Who is even at the right hand of God? Who also makes intercession for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or, or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it's written, for your, sh your sake we're killed all day long. We're counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet, yet in all these things, we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Because he invites us in, Promise and power join together so that nothing God says can be overturned by anyone else. Do you believe that? I accepted the promise of God. Do you look back up to your life? Maybe you can even look back as far as this week and, and say, I've given Satan too much credit. You remember as we started the power of God, what are we talking about? It's not so that as so many who take passages like, Philippians 4, out of 13, out of context. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That we have a God that, that his world revolves around us to give us our every need and to be at our beck and call so that I'm never hurting, I'm never in pain, and, and that's not the God that we read about. But he does invite us into a relationship where he says the world revolves around me. And if your world will revolve around me, we can all experience glory forever together. That's where you will receive the most joy. That's where you will be blessed. Can you look back maybe as short a time as this week and, and realize maybe my religion is weak. There's more pain and doubt and fear than should be evidenced in the life of somebody whose God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The almighty God who's worked wonders throughout the world, who comes along not only in his cosmic power, in his corporate power as a body, but even personally, even personally say, I want to work in your life. The carnal mind, we can erase that. Stop giving so much power to Satan and the flesh. I can change you. Remember, in this life and the one to come, the promise was in Luke 6. It's everywhere. I know I'm, I'm uh, just late belaboring this point, but it's here also. God works in his power. Those who have forsaken lands and fathers and mothers and houses for my name's sake and the gospel, will you not in this time and the time to come receive fathers and mothers and houses and lands for my name's sake? In this time and the time to come. If you aren't experiencing that, there's something wrong with your religion. <laughs> and if we can help you and pray for you, I don't know what it is in each and everybody's need, but maybe there's one here tonight who's never accepted God's power. Realize that by accepting his power and confessing the sweet name of Jesus, repenting of my sins, being baptized in a watery grave of baptism, dying to self, raising to live for him, that the power of God will work in my life. Or as so many of us perhaps can often fail, not trusting in the omnipotent God, if we could pray for you and encourage you tonight to trust in him, to realize the power that ought to be in your life, then we would love to pray for you and encourage you tonight as together we stand and as we sing. Freedom,